Now, secondary worlds, particularly computer-generated um, game-based secondary worlds, allow the player, the learner, to make comparisons with the primary world. Now, we see this in simulations where players play a simulation and they learn about the, um, how to do things in real life based upon how they're doing things in a simulation, which might be a driving simulation or a simulation of managing a city or a simulation of um, sailing a boat um, or running a fast food restaurant. By exploring the simulation, we can learn about how to do things in similar ways in real life. Similar with the concept of secondary worlds. By engaging with a secondary world, we can gain a better understanding of the primary world. Now, the main affordances of this is that by the nature of making it into a secondary world and into a computer game in particular, we will by necessity have to simplify elements of the pro primary world. We'll have to be able to understand those elements and be able to simulate those in a computer game. And it tends to be a much more defined and easily understood process then. And so we can learn about, say, politics between ancient Rome and ancient Greece by exploring that in a computer game and changing certain variables and um, maybe building a larger navy versus a larger army and seeing how that would affect the military um, influences between the two countries, looking at the different religions and how they developed in the two um, nations, looking at the different political systems and exploring how making changes to those systems would affect different things. And by doing this in the secondary world, we gain an understanding of it, similar processes in the primary world. Now, there is a challenge with that in that as a player, your students will be wanting to do better in the secondary world. So what they will be doing is taking their understanding of the primary world and using that understanding to help them do better in playing the game, which is a secondary world. But as an educator, you're primarily, primarily going to be interested in them taking ideas that they develop in the secondary world and how they can apply those understandings to the primary world. So, the learner and the teacher are somewhat at odds in how they're utilising secondary worlds um, in this context. So it's an area just of dissidence, but it's also that dissidence can be advantageous. By looking at that conflict and looking at those differences, we provide um, useful points of analysis and comparison that students can then explore. Why is the secondary world different to the primary world? Why is the primary world different to the secondary world in these instances? Why, if I'm driving a car in the secondary world and I turn the wheel really quickly, the vehicle does such and such, but in the primary world, the doing so might cause an accident and the vehicle to flip over. What's different about the secondary world? And that allows us to have a better understanding of what's happening um, around those differences. Now, one way we look at this is from a cognitive science perspective of mental models. Um, generally in education, we build a large scale understanding of things and then we slowly break that down into smaller and smaller understandings. In computer games, and in particularly in secondary world development and use, we often start in the reverse. We explore things in small detail and master those and by doing a whole series of those small level masterings, often expressed as levels in a computer game or as stages of a campaign or uh, progressing through different aspects of a game series, we slowly build up more and more understanding of the secondary world, more and more understanding of various concepts that allow us to do increasingly more difficult and complex things. So this approach in computer gaming um, is very successful in allowing us to learn about things in a game environment where we slowly build up our capability to do more and more complex tasks, which is somewhat different to how many things are done 
in education otherwise, where we start with a larger picture and then we break it down and then look at how to do smaller elements. Not always, but that's a common approach. So this aspect of mental model development can also be explored in our three levels of secondary world exploration. At the naive level, we're doing simple procedural activities. Um, might be doing some mathematical calculations or learning how to, to work out vectors and in, in physics to be able to move a spaceship around in a game environment. Uh, but it's a whole lot of small, simple mechanical um, elements that we're learning about. So in a survival game, it might be learning about how to build a shelter and how to make a fire, how to find food, how to find water and make sure that the water is safe to drink. So lots of small little elements, none of which are really um, significant in themselves, but collectively they build up essential um, components of our next stage, which is the epics level in a computer game or in secondary worlds. And in this, taking our survival game um, metaphor, this is where we might be having to travel across um, a frozen wilderness and get from one location to another location. Now that's going to be our epic journey. And we're going to, to face polar bears and starvation and hypothermia. Um, and it's going to rely upon all of those smaller skills that we developed as part of our um, naive um, secondary world understandings. But it's now at a level where it's telling an epic story of how we're overcoming challenges. Um, there might be challenges within a group of players uh, where one group wants to do one thing, another group wants to do another thing, and there's a conflict about trying to choose a leader or choose a path. And there might be um, breakaway factions that then compete against one another. So these all form an epic level narrative. And we learn about things from that epic level approach. So how to work in teams, how to overcome um, complex obstacles, how to put together a whole range of different elements together in order to achieve a more complex um, task or challenge. And then we have learnings about the philosophic level. So again, in doing these sort of epic level tasks, we may be learning a bit more about ourselves. Are we a good person or are we willing to do evil in order to achieve our goals? Are we willing to work collaboratively or are we willing to backstab and um, take advantage of other players in order to gain advantage for ourselves. These things help us understand ourselves better in terms of our own morality and our philosophical perspectives on things. But it can also be how we think about the nature of um, the universe. In our exploration of this space, are we relying upon our own, um, our own success or are we um, relying upon the success of others in our group or beyond that in terms of um, an influence of the gods of the secondary world, uh, which might be simply the computer generated systems of the game environment, but are we reliant upon that to achieve success or are we reliant upon our own abilities? So these things can all be built into a philosophical level of educational exploration, looking at these bigger picture elements that we want students to learn about. And some of these things can be things like teamwork, and cooperation, different thinking skills um, that can all be encompassed at that level, but achieved through computer game use. So different players of a computer game will approach um, a secondary world game in different ways, and they'll gain different things from that. Some at the epic level, some at the naive level, some at the philosophical level. And you need to understand that as an educator using computer games, that they can be used at those different levels and that sometimes your players, your students, will gain um, knowledge and understanding, will learn through the use of the computer game, drawing upon those different levels. Um, so one aspect of this is called a game of taxonomy. So with this, there's a few approaches around whether or not you approach a game purely for pleasure as a recreational purpose or do you gain pleasure from the challenge of defeating other players 
or pleasure from overcoming um, abstract challenges, or maybe pleasure from just um, being successful in yourself and surviving and, and helping others and doing things in that way. So we all have different motivations around why we play games and how we get um, pleasure from that process. And this, again, is something you need to be aware of as an educator using computer games, that different students will gain different motivations as to how they engage with the game. And you need to consider that in not only your game design, if you're ga developing games, but also in using games with students. Now, the next aspect is around solving problems in a game. Um, do you take a very strategic approach or do your students take a very strategic calculated approach in how to win the game or overcome obstacles in the game? Or do you rely upon chance and intuition and just go with the flow and see how things and try things out and explore the game in that way? Again, your students will approach things differently as you might approach things differently to others in this course. So you need to think about that in relation to game development and the use of games. And finally, there's the aspect of interactions with others in a game environment. Do you play games primarily to sort of explore your own understanding of yourself and how you learn about different concepts? Or do you, is most of your learning done through others and how you interact with others and explore things and learn from seeing how others do things? and how you interact with them. And that social interaction is the primary focus of your learning in um, secondary world and computer game use. So think about your own applications of those three elements of problem solving, of pleasure, and of learning, um, particularly social aspects of learning um, in your use of computer games. And finally, think about then um, learning through these different levels of um, epic, naive, and philosophical aspects of secondary worlds as they relate to games. What are the factors that um, you would use in terms of naive level um, elements of a secondary world computer game that you could use for teaching students various concepts? What are the concepts that would be best taught at that naive level? What are the concepts that we would be best taught at an epic level? And what are the concepts that you would attempt to teach and develop in students at that philosophical level? And you should be trying to incorporate a range of those. And one approach we use in um, looking at educational technologies is called the TPAC framework, technology pedagogical content knowledge. Now we can extend that to a fourth dimension of the three-dimensional TPAC framework to incorporate game types. Just as we choose particular technologies to support our teaching and various content and various pedagogies to support our teaching, we can also choose various game types. Of course, as we've seen through this course, there are a whole range of different game genres and using a simulation game is quite different to using a puzzle game or a role-playing game. They can all offer different affordances around what you're trying to teach, but um, depending upon what you're teaching, different types of game genres will be more effective. So for example, teaching students how to drive a car using a simulation game would probably be much more effective than using a party game or dance game. Um, so making sure that your technology, pedagogy, content and game type all align will provide the most effective learning experience. We call that the GPAC model or GPAC model. Um, so just one other way of thinking about these aspects of the use of educational games and even within the GPAC model of those four dimensions, we then also have the other dimension, a fifth dimension of um, naive, epic and philosophical aspects of what's trying to be achieved in the game. And some games will be more effective at achieving um, the naive level, others more effective at the epic level and others more effective at the philosophical level. And again, 
your choices of those and which of those levels to use, which game to use, which um, content that you're teaching and which pedagogical approach you're using to teach that and which educational technologies you're using in all of that are all considerations that you should make when you're applying the use of computer games to education. And we'll discuss these in more detail in the tutorials.